practical problem solvers. Now, what do engineers bring to the table? In Sununu's perspective, and this fits very closely with what's taught in engineering education, what engineers bring is analysis, which he describes as the ability to break things down into their component parts, analyze them, and then put together a solution. The thing that needs to happen first, and from Sununu's point of view doesn't happen enough, is to define the problem clearly. He, he says, another important attribute of engineers, I think, is the capacity to recognize that you have got to define the problem clearly before you can start working on a solution. Very important statement here. This is something that we all hear many times in engineering. Namely, that the first thing you have to do in engineering problem solving is to define the problem clearly. When taking this attitude to the public arena, it leads to an interest in developing a comprehensive approach. Think of this term, comprehensive approach, as drawing a very large boundary around a problem, a large boundary that takes in everything. Remember that Sununu was very proud for having achieved billion dollar investments in better climate models. Florman reported that Jimmy Carter, trained as a nuclear engineer, also tended to use the engineer's approach of devising comprehensive programs on this subject or that. So, Sununu's basic point is that if we brought proper engineering problem solving with its more rational approach to things, we'd be much better off. Well, we need now to call attention to one important fact. Sununu was asked to resign. What went on there? How was Sununu's approach to things viewed by others? One way, perhaps, of exploring how others might have found or responded to Sununu is by mapping more closely his world as it is presented in the technology review interview. In so doing, we offer one instance of how this course goes about its business. Firstly, let us ask, how many perspectives exist in this world? When I ask this question in class, students usually raise their hands and answer two. When I ask for elaboration, they pour out ways of describing this. For example, there is the us and there is the them. The us, we are the good guys. The world presented in this interview is divided into two parts. It doesn't seem to be divided into 10 parts or 50 parts, but, but two parts. One student recently said that Sununu seems to be thinking very dualistically. In other words, the world has two parts. In this particular world, the us consists of good technical problem solvers. The them consists of people who live in politics. The group includes the environmentalists. It includes lawyers, bureaucrats, the press, and other Washington groups. Secondly, how are decisions made in the two halves of this world? In the us, on the good guy's side, decisions are made rationally. They are based upon good, solid technical analysis good facts, good data collection, proper analysis, which then leads to rational outcomes or rational decisions. On the other side, the side of the left-wing, commie, pinko, tree-hugging radicals, what we have there is decision-making based upon emotion, on politics, on irrationality. Clearly, what's going on on that side is fundamentally flawed. For if you are basing your decisions on emotions rather than on rationality, you are clearly going to be misguided. Thirdly, what views of technology can be found on these two sides? On our side, we have pro-technology. Technology is inherently a good thing. It contributes to society's progress, economic growth and development, the general welfare of people around the world. On the other side, those left-wing commie pinko radicals are fundamentally anti-technology. It's the emotional commitment that grounds their decision-making. To them, small is beautiful. Any kind of a growth is a bad thing, and growth must be stopped. Lastly, what about global warming? We have already discussed how, from Sununu's point of view on the rational side, what we need is more research and a comprehensive approach to solving the problem of global warming. On the other side is just an irrational desire to shut down production, to shut down or significantly reduce any carbon dioxide emissions on the basis of an emotional commitment rather than on good arguments. All right, now, what does this analysis of John Sununu's world tell us? Let me ask you first. 
to what extent do you picture the world as divided into two parts, the wholly technical and the wholly irrational or emotional? To what extent does that image fit your understanding of current controversies over science and technology? Is it the case that everyone who falls on the side opposed to John Sununu's position is somehow inherently emotional? If you look more closely, you will know, you will likely find a lot of people who themselves may be very bright, trained very well, have high degrees of personal integrity, and, and are paying large attention to the technical components of their climate models. Is it that easy to divide the world into the two parts, the rational and the emotional? Indeed, is the Sununu posi position only on the rational side? When one reads the Technology Review article, one gets the sense that the interviewee and his arguments are dripping with emotion. Emotion arguably exists on both sides in Sununu's world. Furthermore, will conducting more research on climate models and, and making better climate models likely produce an outcome in which the rational side wins and the emotional side loses? As the controversy over global warming has progressed, arguably the sides have not changed very much. Those who argue there is little evidence of global warming are pretty much still standing on that side. And the people who made the case that we should have significant concern about global warming and indeed we have some evidence of global warming, are still standing on the other side. As is quite common in technical controversies, adding new data or evidence rarely leads one side to turn over and agree that it was wrong, or that its arguments were purely emotion. Rather, what tends to happen is greater entrenchment of positions and a continued marshalling of scientific argument. Might it be the case then that the image of the two worlds, one rational and one emotional, be a rather narrow interpretation of what's going on? Might it actually say more about the perspective holding this image than approximate a solid or complete description of life on both sides? If so, how should we understand the source of this perspective, the perspective that populates John Sununu's world? The question that Professor Lisena and I want to raise for you is the following. Is the perspective represented in the technology review interview something that emerged right out of engineering? Could it be a patterned response to the learning of engineering, to the dominant image of engineering knowledge and engineering problem solving? Might dividing the world into two parts be in some ways a direct application of what we learn about ourselves in engineering education? Note the exclusive focus on the technical. The first thing you have to do as an engineer is draw a boundary around the problem. When you have a complicated problem, a complex problem, what you do is you draw a bigger boundary, for one needs a comprehensive approach. The picture of rational decision making in Sununu's world is arguably a logical extension of engineering problem solving, science based problem solving, into the complicated world of government decision making and government regulation. Note that this approach does not take account, doesn't need to take account, of other approaches. By focusing attention entirely on life inside the boundary, it does not prepare engineers to deal with other sorts of boundary drawing. In other words, with perspectives that involve drawing boundaries a little differently. So what happens then when one encounters perspectives other than one's own, especially when one is attempting, attempting to take a comprehensive approach? Well, if these perspectives differ from yours, they are obviously wrong-headed. You pretty much have two options. The first option is to kill off those perspectives. You have to somehow run them down, get around them, beat them, beat them out, or push them to the side because you have the comprehensive true approach. The other option is that you die. Your approach must be lost because the other approach is the better comprehensive one. But what if neither includes the other but are just different? The dominant image of engineering problem solving does not prepare us in any way to deal with people who draw boundaries differently than we do. So, as you go through one or more modules in engineering cultures, Professor Lucena and I would like you to consider the question, does the story of John Sununu perform an engineering stereotype? In other words, a common way people learning engineering problem solving react to it. We would like you to assess this for yourselves. Have you run across this kind of perspective? Do you perform it yourself? 
although we are not saying that this perspective is flawed or wrong in any way, we are insisting that it is just one perspective among many. There are others. Can you think of other ways? Are there other ways in which engineers as people confront the challenge of engineering problem solving and react to it to become engineers? Might you, might we, be able to make these perspectives more visible? Is the only option out there for engineering students, for people who want to make a difference, the goal of developing a technical brilliance mixed with a necessary difficulty in working with other human beings, especially those who might disagree? We don't think so. Accordingly, drawing on the material from modules of this course, we have formulated some strategies to help make visible some other possibilities. We conclude this introduction to engineering cultures by attending to practical questions of method. How might engineers be able to deal with politics? How might engineers work with people who hold perspectives differently than their own, different than their own? Are you able now to work with people who hold perspectives different than your own? The key skill you gain by participating in engineering cultures involves learning how to map engineering problems through people. In engineering, we learn how to solve narrowly defined technical problems. We learn how to draw boundaries around them, abstract them out, solve them in mathematical terms and plug solutions back in. We call this the engineering method. But engineering problems never get solved by themselves. Engineering problems are always solved by people. Once you put people in relationship to one another, new dimensions get added. Every time a problem is solved, someone gains a little power. Someone loses a little power. Someone gains some new contacts. Somebody loses some contacts. Power relations shift and change constantly with each and every engineering decision. And on the job, engineering decisions must be made in association with other groups, other perspectives, other people. How can you be better prepared to deal effectively with people who hold perspectives or positions differently than your own? We call our method problem solving with people. It's a simple but effective extension of engineering problem solving. It focuses on strategies for identifying other perspectives in some context of decision making and then figuring out pathways through which you might actually accommodate yourself to those perspectives rather than convincing yourself you have to defeat them. Problem solving with people calls for three ba basic steps that you might consider using. First, Identify each perspective that's around you and involved in the decisions you face. Remember that problems often mean different things in different perspectives. You might be facing different disciplinary perspectives, different career perspectives, different corporate perspectives, or different national perspectives. Remember that defining the problem clearly, the consummate traditional engineering act, may very well assert one perspective at the expense of others. For me to define the problem in a way that might be clear in my terms just might not be clear in your terms. Once we think about problem solving in relationship to people, we can begin to see that the very act of drawing a boundary around a problem has non-technical 